Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. This session is on the emerging competition between fintechs and MFIs. Um, technology is changing the landscape and is creating a tension that is, can be very positive for outcomes to expand MSC finance. And what we're trying to do in this session is to try to understand how that tension will show up in the market. What are the factors and under what aspects one model or the other might be superior uh, or not. Um, my name is Javier Fass, and I lead an area in SIGA that is called uh, Technology and Business Model Innovations. And I'm joined here by my other SIGA colleague, Alexander Sotirio, who um, leads uh, an area that is on, uh, focused on MSC finance. And we're, uh, we're both going to um, lead and moderate this session. So to get started, as we were mentioning before, for those of you who were here first, we will, get, we will be using Slido as a polling tool. So this is a good time to log into slido.com on your phones and use the code that is up on the screen on the top right without the pound sign, EMW2022. As you do that, let me, um, let me continue. This, this session, the title of this session, uh, is a reference to that tension that I was speaking about earlier. It is an artificial construct. So it's not a debate about who's going to win because there's going to be one winner. We know it's uh, not likely to play out like that. Uh, markets have many different contexts, and depending on a number of factors, one provider uh, might be better than the other. Um, and it's likely that for some segments, some products, one might be better, the other might not. And uh, it's likely to be a more complex uh, interaction what prevails. But it's important to try to push ourselves to I try to identify how these different models might defer or might, might improve uh, things. So let me briefly introduce the agenda. We're going to start with a brief um, introduction uh, to frame the conversation. Then we're going to go to a moderated debate with a set of panelists here that I will be introducing shortly. Then we will do a Q&A for 20 minutes, and then we'll use a few minutes at the end to conclude. We know that none of this is real. All these times are not going to be real, but we'll try. Um, all right, so let me introduce our fantastic set of panelists. We're really proud um, to have them here today. Uh, let me start with Dorcas Torp. She's the head of corporate planning at Lapo Microfinance Bank in Nigeria, who offers a broad range of financial services to MSCs. She's joining us online, and she'll be up on the screen shortly. Uh, we're also joined by Fatma Nasujo. She's the global head of corporate operations in Wasoko. Wasoko is an e-commerce company that provides inventory finance to small mom and pop shops in Kenya. And they're also present on an, in a number of other markets in Africa. We also have Grégoire Lecomte, who is Chief Operations Officer at Simplify. Um, Simplify is a fintech cross -board that provides cross-border solutions for MSCs. And we have also Stephen Duchatel, who is CEO of Advance Group, a group of microfinance institutions that operates across nine countries. They will provide a, a brief introduction about their companies and the work they do in MSC Finance. So they'll do that um, shortly after. Um, all right, so let me, okay, I missed putting this up front. Um, so let me start by um, calling out the importance of micro and small enterprises in developing economies. Micro and small enterprises are the foundation of the livelihoods of many poor people, low-income people in, in our markets. And financial services are a critical component that enables them to grow, to be sustainable, and to be resilient. However, many remain excluded from financial services, especially those MSCs that are more rural, that are informal, or that are women-owned. 
Across the spectrum, the total demand for finance is estimated to be around eight trillion. So that includes both on the informal and the formal side for micro and for small enterprises. The supply, though, is a little bit less than half of what is needed, and therefore the gap is estimated to be around five trillion per year. So there's a lot of work to do. Now, the reason we have such a big gap is because there are very strong barriers. Uh, and these barriers have to do with the high operating expenses involved in serving these markets, MSC, micro and small uh, enterprise markets. Um, there's also an issue or difficulties in assessing credit risk accurately. And there's also a perception, uh, or maybe a real perception, around the low lifetime value of these customers. So these are hard factors that prevent commercial um, and private sector to really reach these micro and small enterprises. However, technology is changing the game, is changing the landscape in important ways. Uh, digital payments are enabling effective movement of money between people, um, enabling ins institutions to serve larger areas, uh, larger geographies. Digital data trails enable better credit scoring and APIs facilitate better integrations across companies. So the combination of these things is leading to new business models. And those business models can be pretty powerful in serving these segments and addressing the barriers that have been there persistently. These um, developments are impacted or are shown in four specific areas. One has to do with cost, reducing the cost of operation, uh, another way in which the impact can be seen is in, in improving or expanding access, um, improving the tailoring of products, improving the fit of products, and also improving the experience and the journey of customers in their usage of financial services. We're going to be using those aspects to structure the debate that will follow. But having said that, we need to recognize that the MSC finance landscape is very diverse and it may feel at times a bit chaotic just because of the diversity of sources of finance, formal, informal, uh, and many different types, many different kinds of products. From the provider side, many of these institutions will digitize in some way and they will be ahead of the game. Others will not be able they will struggle to adapt and they might fall behind. On the MSC side, some will digitize and will be able to benefit from this expanded set of services by digital providers, but some may not digitize and may not be able to benefit from, from that, may fall behind. So the outcome of how the digitization process can change markets, both on the MSC side and on the supply side, is difficult to grasp, it's not so straightforward. But we do know that when we look at microfinance institutions that have been proactively adopting technology and digitalizing, there are good examples, not many, but there are good examples around the world where we see that there is documented evidence of impact in the business model of MFIs that digitalize. In the screen we have five institutions um, that have done this in different ways. They've managed to increase, increase productivity, reduce loan processing times, increase um, the way they reach women, increase savings mobilization, and reduce operating costs. On the FinTech side, what we see is a range of new business models emerging. And we have tried to analyze those business models and we classified them in four, four families. We have a deck that we will be publishing very soon where we go in depth describing these different four families of business models and we describe different subsets and, and classifications of different companies that are operating and, and using those business models and the kinds of products they offer. In general, these four business types are one is data-driven lending, when you use cash flow data or purchases to assess cash flows and offer um, inventory loans or working capital loans. Marketplace lending uh, takes advantage of 
you know, connecting investors with borrowers, uh, so lower cost of funds and uh, targeted lending. Uh, digital banking takes advantage of very sophisticated technology stacks, um, a, license, a banking license, and um, sort of a agile product development that is very effective at product market fit and developing really good products that meet the needs of customers. And embedded finance is a way in which integration between financial service providers, uh, wholesale lenders, and non-financial services companies that have large scale can integrate and offer finance um, in, in a way that is integrated so that it's the right kind of finance for the right kind of product at the right moment. This is very shorthand. I don't think this is a really great description, but just a shorthand, but in the uh, publication that you will be putting out soon, you should be able to get a very detailed description of these. But the point that we want to make is that these business models are there, they're emerging, and they are showing very promising signs of their capacity to serve micro and small enterprises with the products they need. So at this point, we want to raise the question, right? So in the end, what will prevail? Is it traditional microfinance that, is, that have been serving um, sustainably customers in the micro end of the spectrum for a long time? Microfinance institutions that can digitize and be ahead of the game? Or these new players, new fintechs that are using technology in powerful ways to come up with, um, with the right kinds of products? So let me stop there and pass the mic to Alexander, who will moderate the debate. Thank you, Javier. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, providing the, the background and the context to the situation that we're looking at. So I, I think we've put a pretty good uh, foundation out there in terms of the changes that digital technology are bringing, both to older, established incumbent business models, like those of microfinance institutions, as well as uh, new up-and-coming fintech businesses uh, that are emerging. And so the question is, who's going to win the race? As Javier said, it's a bit of a false dichotomy because we know it's going to be both and neither and sometimes everything, but we've orchestrated what we hope will be an engaging uh, discussion. Before going into it, though, I just want to highlight and reiterate again that we will be using Slido. <clears throat> so. If you have a chance, take out your phone, go to slido.com and enter the hashtag. There's a warm-up uh, survey there. I see that there are 20 answers already to the, to the warm-up uh, survey, which is great. We'll be going back to that uh, at each round of the debate. We're gonna have four rounds uh, to see who the winner is. Uh, but in the meantime, you can go into Slido. Again, slido.com, hashtag EMW2022. So you have it set up and are, are ready when we uh, get to it. So as I mentioned, we're going to have four rounds of, uh, of, of this debate. And they're going to be structured along the lines of what Javier presented, cost, access, fit, and experience. Uh, and at the end of that, we'll have some discussion. So just to uh, kick things off on the cost issue. Uh, We all know that cost is, is, is a big issue. Uh, a big driver of cost is the operating expense relative to the small uh, ticket sizes that we see in microfinance. So as a result, you know, on an APR basis or an interest rate basis, interest rates tend to be higher than they are for uh, larger corporates. There's very good reasons for that, but we believe that uh, digital technologies have some promise in being able to uh, bring those down. But the question is, uh, which will be uh, uh, better off. So, <clears throat> question to the panelists, and we're gonna have each panelist answer this question. Uh, we're gonna give you four minutes each. And the question is, which type of organization, fintechs or MFIs, uh, are best positioned to address the cost challenge and why? So, uh, let's just go in the order that we're, we're seated here. So. Greg, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Fatma, Stephen, and we'll end with Dorcas uh, online. So, Gregoire, you have four minutes. Thank go. You. Thank you very much. Um, so, simplify just quickly. We are a fintech B2B2C 
providing capital, um, on-demand capital to finance micro enterprise in emerging markets. Uh, we work on an embedded finance model where we partner with um, platforms such as you know, e-commerce platform, logistic platform, um, as well as digital banks. And so we have a risk assessment model where we you know, select the potential uh, end borrowers or end users of this platform who can access by an pay later or on a very transactional, um, transa transactional view on the credit. And for the ones that are not eligible, um, they can ask for someone from the diaspora who live in the UK, EU, and the US so that they can provide a refundable deposit so that they can still be eligible to access finance. And we have this unsecured and secured way, and the goal, of course, is to take the one from the secured way to the unsecured way so that they can, they can be financially independent. Um, I would say, you know, coming from the, you know, um, as a fintech, uh, we clearly, be, you know, we fairly believe that being able to provide a seamless experience, partnering with, with you know, with companies that already has acquired these clients and providing these additional services is a way to provide cost, um, you know, funding at lower cost on a transactional basis with a better control, of, with a better control of how the money is used. Um, to also be able to provide some pr cash collateral to these loans is also a way to reduce the cost of funding and the operational costs related to the transactions because in case of default, there is always a way to get you know, a quick, repay, uh, quick repayment on the loans. So clearly from our point of view, um, do, having a fully digital process, a digital risk assessment and risk scoring, combined with um, an embedded solutions that can deliver on demand capital is a way to bring costs down uh, compared to what they can access in the market. Thank you very, very much and, and very timely. Um, so I think already we're breaking the paradigm of, of fintechs versus MFIs because we have the, a collaboration, uh, but clearly, you know, fintech being the, the facilitator of, of the digitization and, and um, uh, efficiencies that, that we're talking about, so, so thank you. Uh, Fatma, can we go to you next? Uh, and, and yes, I neglected to mention, if you could please also imp introduce yourself and, and your company a little bit in, in your opening remarks. Uh, my name is Fatma Nasujo, uh, Head of Corporate Operations at Wasuko. Uh, of the 850 billion FMCG market in Africa, 80% of it runs through informal uh, traders. These are the mom and pop shops that are on the street corners providing flour, sugar, milk to the residents of the neighborhoods in which they live. Um, these people, to restock their businesses, will need to maintain relationships with individual suppliers. They will need to close stores to go and get new stock to uh, replenish their stock. And this results in a loss of cash uh, in terms of sales and also results in a waste of time. What Wasuka does is we have provided a B2B e-commerce platform that enables them to order stock from multiple suppliers on our platform, and then we deliver it same day or next day, depending on the time that they order to their businesses, saving them both time and money. Because we operate a fast party model, we are able to buy in bulk from suppliers, get it at the best price, and then sell it to our retailers who can then pass on the cost savings to their um, customers. <coughs> Uh, working with these suppliers, we, uh, with these traders, we realize very quickly that working capital is a challenge that they face. And so what we've done is embed uh, financial uh, payment options for them, which enables them to sell fast and then pay later. What this means is that they can take a stock on, from us on credit, sell it, and then be able to repay that. So that is our way of uh, embedding finance for our customers. Um, this enables them to experiment uh, with the new products because if they couldn't afford it before, they're able to take credit, try out a new product, get higher margin returns, and, enable, uh, and rotate their capital within the business very quickly. This is essential for these traders because in Kenya, among other countries, um, these shops are the fast source of credit. People buy from them on credit, and then pay at the end of the month or when they get their cash flows. But then these suppliers are not able to get that credit from their own uh, suppliers. These traders are not able to get that credit from their own suppliers. So having the BNL product that we have helps them grow their businesses. Um, currently, 10% of our monthly revenues are done through the BNPL. 
So in terms of cost, definitely, we have a relationship with these customers. We are able to check their credit ratings uh, and still deliver to them within the existing rails of the e-commerce platform. As such, uh, this is an example of where fintech companies are reducing the cost and enabling um, traders and other credit users to get access to credit cheaper, faster, and something that's more customized to them. Thank you so, so much, Fatma. And then it, that's a paradigm example of the embedded finance business model that, that Javier mentioned in his introduction. Uh, again, just a, a quick plug, CGAP will be coming out with a publication on, on the subject relatively soon. Um, Stephen, over to you. Uh, could you please tell us who, which uh, type of company, an MFI or a FinTech, will, will be the, the, the future? We've just heard from two fintech companies. Uh, in one scenario, you could think of these companies as the future of microfinance for uh, uh, particularly traders. <clears throat> so tell us why, why that's not the case and why uh, MFIs will still be uh, important in, in serving that segment. Uh, maybe I will tell you the contrary. <laughs> right? That would be interesting. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel. Uh, also, I'm, I'm not so happy to be part of the old uh, world, you know, old, uh, old business model, but anyway. Uh, so, Advance, as a brief introduction, it's, a, it's an international microfinance group <laughs> operating in nine countries, Africa and Asia. We've been around uh, since 2005. Uh, we serve more than uh, 1.3 million clients with a total loan portfolio of 2 billion euros and total deposit of 1.1 billion uh, euros. So, we are a full service group. Uh, everywhere we, we can, we try to offer credit, deposit, uh, payment services, insurance, etc., etc. And our focus and our ambition is really to become uh, the financial partner of choice for, for small enterprise, meaning micro, small and medium enterprise. Um, so, um, answering your question, uh, who is the best uh, place to reduce uh, operating cost and cost of funding for, for, uh, for small, uh, small enterprises? It's a difficult question. I, uh, we would have to look at the numbers. I don't know how much my colleagues are charging, uh, <laughs> etc. But uh, I want more to share our experience. Huh? What can digitalize it? How can digitalization help us to reduce our operating costs? Because indeed they are high and they explain the relatively high funding cost of our clients. Also, as a side note, in the current context, we should not also uh, overlook uh, financing costs, which are also uh, growing today and creating some, some problems. But anyway, so uh, digitalization can help uh, through the use of data. Uh, typically, uh, you use data at several steps of the loan process, from uh, prospection to appraisal to follow-up uh, to recovery. Uh, and this can help you significantly drive down your cost. And the second process is, of uh, the second application of technology is, of course, um, uh, how do you automate and digitalization uh, as many front office or back office process as you can, so that uh, you keep really uh, the human interactions are dedicated only to high uh, added value interactions, right? So what we call the high tech I touch model. And this is our model today. This is what we are stri striving to achieve. Um, we are in the middle of our digital transformation process. Uh, but I still, we, I, I'm a strong believer in this high tech, I touch uh, model. And I think that the future of our, for MFI, now whether we will win the race or whatever, that's a question for the end. So we'll see. Thank you very much. Uh, and excellent kicking off of uh, dodging the question a, a little bit, but we'll see how that, that is reflected in, in, the, uh, in the polls of, of who's going to win this quote-unquote debate. Speaking of which, I'll just transition briefly before we go over to Dorcas on the line. Let's see how the results of the survey came out uh, of the uh, initial one. So let me see here. Yeah, if I can find the mouse. Oh, here we are. Sorry. The beauty of tech, huh? The beauty yeah, of technology. technology. There you go. There's <laughs> stuff. Let's see. Here we are. Okay, most people are other. Good to know. <laughs> A lot of investors in the room. Uh, 
many consultants, a few MFIs, not too many donors. Let's see the other parts of this warm-up. Okay, most people here in Europe and uh, quite a African and North American uh, contingent along with some people from South America and Asia as well. And then the question of the day, starting with the baseline, <laughs> who's going to win the race? We're very evenly split. This is the baseline. I'm going to cut things off right now for this poll. Uh, and in a moment, we'll... <laughs> I'll just uh, go back to the presentation. Uh, can we get Dorcas on the screen, please? Um, after Dorcas presents, we'll ask who's going to uh, win on cost. So, Dorcas, can, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Great, yes, and we, we see you very well, too. So, uh, the question, who's going to reduce costs best, uh, MFIs or fintechs? Uh, over to you. You have four minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I definitely think that there is a silent cold war between, you know, fintechs and the banks. Um, so this platform gives us the opportunity to really share uh, more on that and learn from one another. So thank you for having me on um, this platform. Um, so my name is Dr. Stop. I lead the corporate planning department at LAPO Microfinance Bank, which is a spin-off of um, LAPO. LAPO stands for Lift Above Poverty Organization. Um, started over 30 years ago, um, focused on um, empowering the economically poor, um, economically active poor, empowering them with, you know, um, credit, with savings, insurance, any financial products and services really to help them, you know, come out of, out, out of poverty. Um, our focus, our target market has always been the MSMEs, um, with, a, with more focus on women. Um, it started first with giving a credit of less than $1 to three women um, in the state in Nigeria. And over the years, it has grown to become um, a national li licensed a microfinance bank in Nigeria, operating out of over three, 535 branches um, and a couple of agents as well. Um, we're in 34 states of the 36 states in Nigeria. Um, so far, we have offered our products to over 6 million clients. Um, in terms of credit, we've disbursed over 2 trillion naira, which is an approximately um, $3 billion to MSMEs. So we know the, the MSMEs, we understand the challenge um, in, that, in that segment. And for me, that would be why I would say that indeed the MFIs are best positioned um, to, to, um, to provide solution to the, to the cost issues and to access issues within this, um, within this space. But with a caveat to say that it's the forward-thinking MFIs, um, those who are digitizing um, internal processes that can actually do this um, in the near future. Um, why, why do I say that? When you look at the segment today, what exactly um, are the reasons, um, what are the challenges? And then when you talk about cost, what, what, what are the factors you know, that we use in determining costs? One is your, your cost of funding. Another is your risk pricing. Um, another, is, um, another is your personal expenses. So for the MFI, how then do we reduce that cost? It's first to begin to digitize processes internally um, that would help us um, reduce the cost of operations. Um, the fact that we're also operating a cluster model of operations, then that reduces cost to serve these customers. Um, when you talk about the risk pricing as well, looking at um, repayment rates, looking at um, fraud issues, for the MFIs, our model of um, a model of the group methodology, um, our model to also to our physical touch um, with these people helps you know, build that trust. So when there's trust, you know, there's that fiscal engagement with them, then repayment history, um, repayment rates are improved. And so we're able to price our, our credit um, products in such a way um, that is you know, favorable to this target segment, having looked at you know, those risk issues, having reduced our cost of operations you know, by digitizing internal processes, um, and also um, cost of fund, how, how have, have we um, 
mobilize our funds, you know, to to disburse the way we're doing so far. Initially, we had started with you know accessing grants and credit from other institutions, but now as we're focusing more on you know mobilizing savings as well, and that helps to reduce the cost of funds. So that in general helps our pricing model um, for the credit products that we offer to this segment. But again, it's important that we're talking about this segment and not just anyone, it's the micro small enterprises. And there are challenges within that segment that the MFIs are best positioned to, um, to, to, to solve, best positioned to reach um, with technology, of, of course. And then, so we're just going to really leverage on our physical touch points and also digital um, processes. So we are best positioned to, to serve this particular segment. Thank you very much, Dorcas. Uh, it's a strong case for microfinance. So you're really getting into to the spirit of the, of the debate here. <laughs> Let's see how this has uh, translated into the results. So you should have the first uh, round Slido poll up. Uh, in your apps, so please just go into that now. And, and the question is, 10 years from now, which type of company do you think is gonna be most likely to provide lower costs and responsible loans to micro enterprises? So please go in now uh, and give us your results. We'll leave it closed just for a minute and then see who won this first round. Uh, the next round, just to tease that up a little bit, will be on the issue of access. Uh, so who's going to be able to push the frontier further? But right now, we're just focused on costs. So 10 years from now, which type of company uh, is going to provide lower costs? Well, so let's take a look at the results. See if I can get this to show. Yep, now my cell phone has... MFIs, okay. Oh, no, we're <laughs> evenly split right down the middle. This is, a, this is a tough debate here. All right, I'll leave that up for a minute, but I'm, for people who want to or haven't gotten into it yet, again, slido.com, hashtag, just enter in EMW2022. Uh, let's move on to the next round of the debate. And for this one, uh, again, Dorcas, we're gonna start off with you in, in just a minute and then we're gonna have Gregoire uh, respond. And this is very much related to the issue of cost, but now we're talking about access. There are many people who are still excluded and underserved, as Javier alluded to, uh, particularly uh, women-owned businesses, people in uh, MSEs and, and rural areas, other uh, uh, segments of MSEs are underserved as well because of the cost of putting, uh, uh, reaching them. So the question is, first off, which do you think is more important uh, to provide access? Uh, building out more physical touch points, say through agent networks, uh, or helping the MSEs themselves become digitized so that they can access purely digital uh, channels? And which type of player is best positioned to do those, MFIs or FinTechs? So, Dorcas, we're going to start with you. We have less time. This time we're going to do something a bit more complicated. Two minutes, two minutes, and then quick rebuttals. So we'll see if we can manage this. So, uh, Dorcas, you have two minutes. All right. I think you've already mentioned some of the challenges um, facing the MSMEs. Um, one is the, the fact that um, they are us usually in the semi-urban rural um, areas, and that itself has you know, challenges about infrastructure, connectivity, um, and unavailability of you know, mobile devices for the rural dwellers as well. Um, and that, that is an issue. And um, when you also look at the fact that they're also um, very, they're not literate, well, they're less literate, um, in terms of digital savviness, you're also less digital savvy. Um, they're usually one-man businesses, lower revenues, and you know, of course, lower um, access to collaterals and all of that. So these are the characteristics of MSMEs. And so for, for us, um, having looked at that, it's easier to go to them, to reach them. It's easier to continue to build distribution channels um, that has physical touch to it. 
Um, it doesn't have it doesn't necessarily have to be branches, right? You mentioned agents, um, experience centers, POS merchants, but just to create that um, fiscal presence for the MSMEs. The fact that you know trust is also an issue with this set of people. How do they trust you with your funds? How do they trust that there wouldn't be you know cyber crimes that would defraud them? Um, so to build that trust, there needs to be that fiscal engagement. And the fact that there were human beings, human interaction is also very important even today. So it emphasis has to be on creating that you know fiscal interaction with these people, meeting them at the point of need, but also using digital channels. And that's why it's a hybrid, um, building agent networks where you could go to them, the agents are able to offer the services digitally. It improves um, the speed, the turnaround time of service delivery. However, there is a there's a there's a face to it where they can um, share issues, where they can get insights from. They just, you know, um, have someone to hold on to, someone to refer to when there are, when there are problems. And I think that that's why the MFIs will um, bridge this gap of access to MSMEs via physical touch points. But Dorcas, digitally... I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off there, uh, just in the interest of time and apologies. Uh, but uh, we have a, a tight schedule we're trying to, to manage to. But it, you definitely made a, a strong case. And thank you for that. Uh, uh, Gregoire? Yeah. We heard the case from MFIs in terms of access. Can you give us the, the FinTech uh, case? And then we'll do quick rebuttals after that. So you have two minutes. Thank you. No, so we are fairly believers that the funding should be correlated and linked to a product. And the fact that we are you know, working with platforms who are providing an essential sol solutions and services so that micro enterprise can do their businesses, you know, such as e-commerce, um, <clears throat> you know, so, such as what uh, is doing. The fact that you can tight uh, short-term quick access to funding on transactions, this is the best way to access and increase the size of microenterprise who can access funding. This requires, of, of course, to leverage, you know, sales network, agent network, so that they can work with the microenterprise on how, you know, you can deliver the, the key product. But as you are users of one product that is essential for your business, if they provide you access to funding, you are more likely to use them than go and download another mobile app that will give you access to the funding only. So having this embedded solution for us is really what is going to make a big difference in terms of access and will also allow us to go um, to the extra miles to an uh, area where it's more difficult because you don't go only for the funding, you go for your core business combined to a funding solutions. Thank you, Gregoire. Very strong case for, for the embedded finance solution. Uh, now, can we go back to, to Dorcas again? Uh, do you have a, a, a rebuttal to, to what Gregoire has, has said of uh, the importance of integrating financial services into these other value chains really gives a, a big advantage. Any, uh, a quick 30-second rebuttal, if you, if you have one, or, or closing remarks on this issue of uh, access. Over to you. Well, I, okay. Um, I, I think that would uh, be around how much you can scale um, and, and reach these people, really, especially when you're having um, people who cannot you know, use those, those solutions, but digital solutions, really, um, who are not digital savvy, who... Um, are not, you know, literate enough, um, how well can we reach them and um, enough with those solutions? And then the issue of trust um, is also there. So it's it's going to be, um, it, there's just a, a tiny set part of the MSMEs that you probably would reach, you know, using those. Um, but when you have physical touch points as well, then you have access to a larger um, part of that market. Thank you very much. Gregoire, uh, uh, over to you to... Uh, wrap up, uh, respond to that. Issues of trust and scale, very important. Yeah. Uh, 30 seconds, uh, over to you. But for the trust, I mean, it's what we you know, I, I just said before, the fact that you are using already, you know, a platform that is bringing you your essential way of doing your business, you anyway going to trust them because they, del they deliver to you what you need on your day-to-day -day basis. So I don't see any issue with this. <clears throat> and the scalability as, as also mentioned is you don't go only for one solution that allows you to have multiple sources of revenues to have a digitized way combined with you know an agent model that helps you delivering these services 
to be micro SME allows you, you know, to scale because you don't go only for one reason. Thank you very much and, and right on time, perfect. Uh, so I think we have an actual debate on our hands now, ladies and gentlemen, so <coughs> let's take a look and see. Uh, let me open up the next poll to see who won this debate and the question, again, on, on the point of access, 10 years from now, which type of company is going to expand access more, MFIs or fintechs? Uh, we've just had a really interesting debate on the, the subject. Uh, we see fintechs in an in a early lead, but only 21 people reporting so far. This is a very evenly split op audience. We have a really, really tight race. Uh, but, but fintechs, it seems like, just edging ahead. So as I'll leave that up for, for oh. oh my goodness, <laughs> oh, MFIs now ahead. Okay, I think we have a, a biased <laughs> audience at the European Microfinance yeah, it's true. Week, but uh, you know we might have to discount, give a handicap to the microfinance uh, a question here. So uh, let's move on to the next question. I still have the, the poll up, so if, if you haven't had a chance yet, please, uh, again, slido.com, EMW 2022. Uh, it's still up there, and you can see uh, that poll. I'll keep it up for just a minute. But moving on to the next uh, question of fit. So here we're going to be asking Fatma and Steven to uh, the same type of setup, two minutes, two minutes, and then quick rebuttals. Uh, and the question here has to do with the fact that well, we all know that MSEs are not uh, a monolith. They differ across many types of segments. There are uh, rural and urban, uh, women-owned, men-owned, um, different sectors. And each micro-entrepreneur has a very unique set of circumstances. At the same time, because of issues of, of scalability and some of the cost issues we've described, most uh, lenders to these segments tend to provide a limited range of products which don't, aren't always perfectly tailored to meet their needs. So the question to the two of you is, um, well, first off, do you think hyper-personalization and tailoring is even feasible when it comes to micro-enterprise finance to meet the specific needs of individual entrepreneurs? Uh, and in general, what is your strategy to uh, meet the diverse needs of the uh, MSE segments that, that you focus on. So let's start, Fatma, with you. Uh, you have two minutes to uh, start the question, then we'll come back to you for 30 seconds at, at the end. Um, so yes, hyper-personalization is possible, and especially for fintechs. Uh, hyper-personalization is um, dependent on data. If your organization has access to data and is able to analyze the data, then you're able to personalize the customer experience. And experience is not just products, uh, it's also how they access you, or their touch points, and it's also uh, the advice that you give your customers. Yeah, so if you're only collecting data and it sits in files somewhere, there's nothing you can do with it. Uh, but if you are collecting your data, analyzing it, and giving on-the-fly experience, then there's um, improvements that we can do with this. So for instance, at Wasoko, we have three channels by which customers can reach us. If you have a smartphone, you can use the app, you can use WhatsApp. If you don't, you use SMS, and you're able to use the short code, and you're able to access us. If that doesn't work, you can speak to our, customer, to our call center. So that helps you personalize the experience. Additionally, based on the regions that we operate in, we are able to tell these are the products that move quickly, that have high margin in your area, and we will recommend that to our customers. That enables them to grow their sales, enables them to have their working capital move uh, very quickly, and it helps them to continue to grow their businesses from the profits that they continue to make. Um, last but not least, it's also the advice that we give them uh, and our suppliers as well, because we have the data. We will be able to tell our suppliers, in this region, your uptake is not great. Your marketing is not, as in your product is not known, you need to improve your marketing. So how then, it's, it's possible for us to, to be able to personalize the experience for both our customers and our suppliers. Thank you very much. It's a strong case for hyper-personalization uh, as a possibility. Uh, Stephen, over to you. Yeah, um, so 
I think Fatma mentioned it. Huh? We, are, we are not necessarily talking about uh, hyper personalization of product, but personalization of experience. Huh? For me, I don't think our, our clients expect hyper personalization of everything. They first want access, convenience, simplicity, respect, trust, uh, building a long term relationship, price, or so. All of this is probably more important, as I see it, that, than hyper personalization. And for, uh, let's say, uh, 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 microfinance institutions such as us, uh, which have the ambition to serve a relatively large uh, universe of clients, or, or, or focus is more on delivering the right products through the right channel to the right segment, because each segment has its own specificities. So we, we, we try to personalize our, our approach by segment rather than by client, I would say. Huh? So we have many initiatives. Uh, in the past, on uh, Cocoa Farmers in Côte d'Ivoire, on uh, Women Traders in, uh, in uh, Cambodia, where we progressively onboard clients, typically on digital solutions, and then we, we open new product, we offer new product, new, uh, new solution for them. But it's a strategy per segment. So I don't know if that's what you call hyper-personalization, but uh, that's what we are trying to do. Certainly goes in that direction. Thank you, Stephen. So, Fatma, over, over to you. 30-second uh, rebuttal or closing thoughts on this issue of fit. Um, again, the, the thing I would focus there on is on the segmentation. Uh, sometimes there are clients who don't fit in the segment. They would be left out if we followed that approach in the sense that there's a product maybe that doesn't work for the women in a particular segment or the youth in a particular segment. With hyper-personalization, which fintechs can do, then everyone is included. Yeah, I've not Steven, met this client seconds. yet. <laughs> Personally, I've not met this client yet. Uh, no, um, I, I want to say something about, I mean, uh, fintech are, are, fin, a good fintech is good at collecting data and using it wisely. Uh, and you will probably remain better than microfinance uh, on that for, for some time. We are fast learner too, but uh, we, it's not our DNA. But the microfinance has an advantage in terms of data. We have the data, the expense of our, of our staff, right? And this is data which is in their brain. So, and, and it's not in paper or file or whatever, but it's still data that you can use to better understand and adjust uh, your service to our clients. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let's stop there for, for this round. And I'll move on to the, see what the audience thinks. Who won this part of the debate? Uh, again, question on fit. Uh, Ten years from now, which type of company is going to be better able to meet the diverse <laughs> needs of so many different MSE segments? Again, fintech's in a lead. I think the people who say fintech are just quicker on the Slido. This is how it started out last time. <laughs> so you fintech people are just... Oh, it's, there's a big yeah. difference here. <clears throat> but the MFIs, let's see if they, they can come up from behind here. They are wiser, yep. so they take more time. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one more round in the debate, uh, in the structured part of the debate. Then we're going to open up the questions to all of you. Uh, Please, if you have questions, you can put them in the Slido it itself. You can upvote other people's questions in the platform. Uh, otherwise, we will just take uh, audience questions. We're doing pretty good on time, so we ought to have plenty of time for some uh, good questions from the audience. So uh, I think fintechs are the winner on this one when it comes to, to fit. Um, fintechs pulled ahead. So let's move on to the last sort of structured round. Uh, see some <clears throat> questions on there. Again, uh, please put in more questions or we'll just take uh, uh, questions from the audience. So, so we're going to uh, just ask everybody, with everything you've heard to the audience, why do you think your company or others like it are best positioned uh, to provide financial services to micro enterprises and small enterprises in this increasingly digitized economy uh, that we see. And I, I think for this one, let's go in the, in the reverse order that we started with. So if we can uh, ask Dorcas to uh, be the first person to respond. Here we just have a few seconds, like 30 seconds or so, final high-level thoughts. 
Uh, everybody should get a chance to talk also afterwards during the audience Q&A. So Dorcas, 30 seconds, uh, go. All right, so I think we're um, familiar with this new term that's um, out there now, digital, and there's a reason why the physical part of that um, term it comes first, you know, before digital, is the fact that when you're narrowing down on the specific characteristics of this segment, the SM, um, MSMEs, um, there are challenges that, you know, digital um, completes or digitalization <laughs> of you know, products and services cannot attend to. Um, so you still need to take them on a journey um, by, you know, having your physical and your digital um, footprints out there. And um, for MFIs, it just positions us well because we already have the spread, we have the footprint, we have the channels. Um, when you layer technology and digital channels on that, then, I mean, the, the, the sky is the limit for, for accessibility, for scale. Um, so in a sense, if you're not digitally savvy, we, we have you covered. If you're digitally savvy, then you use our digital channels. And Thank then we you. Have Thank you, Dorcas. So. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off again. Just trying to keep on, on time. Uh, Stephen, over to you, 30 seconds. No, I think Dorca said a lot of uh, things. You know, this high tech, high touch uh, approach that uh, MFI, which managed to go through a digital transformation, can offer to their client is a plus. Then we have also the balance sheet, the expense in risk management, you know, cost, uh, credit risk, operational risk, etc. So I think we, are, we have a, a few strong advantage to remain relevant uh, for, the, for the many decades to come. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Fatma? Uh, your response, uh, giving the, the fintech side, again, 30 seconds, go. Banking and access to financial services needs to change from somewhere you go, whether this is an app or a physical location, to something you do. And it doesn't matter where you are. It's part of what you do. And the fintechs are most uh, suited to create that, whether it's through our Soko app where you can make your payments, where, they, where you can access credit, where you can access insurance, or it's that physical and digital touch points that we have that enable customers to grow and uh, expand their business. Thank you, Fatma. There seems second. to be a consensus about the digital or high-tech, high-touch approach, but whether it will be fintechs or, or MFIs is the uh, question. And Gregoire, you have the, the last word on, on the subject. Yeah, I think that fintech are able to provide an on-demand, transaction-based uh, you know, liquidity to micro-enterprise, which I would say the high-touch branch model does not allow. And the fact that to be able to, to work closely with you know, highly data-driven uh, companies allow you know, to expand the, the, you know, like <clears throat> allow to bridge the gap of funding to micro SMEs that are currently not covered or, you know, partially covered by the option that exists today. Thank you very much. So that concludes the, the formal part of the, the debate that we have. I'll open up the final uh, poll, but I won't show the results quite yet. I'll, I'll leave it open while we do the... Um, while we do the, the Q&A. So we'll get to the final verdict at the end. Uh, let me look at what's happening in the Q&A. Uh, let's see, the, the race to what has gotten the most upvotes, but I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> I think the, it's the race to uh, serve, provide more and better services to excluded and underserved MSEs using digital technologies. Uh, that's how we've defined this, this session. The next highest one, uh, let's see, we have, are, aren't MFIs naturally becoming hybrid fintechs as time goes by? So maybe, Stephen, do you want to res respond to that? No, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's exactly what uh, MFI uh, needs to do. Huh? Uh, if they don't, uh, whether they will disappear totally or not, or you know, progressively uh, lose market share, or ultimately not reach their goal of financial inclusion uh, remains to be seen. But definitely, if you want to, to better serve your clients and to contribute to financial inclusion, you need to, to, to take advantage of, this, uh, of what digital, uh, digitalization is offering. Also, it's, it's, not, it's not the silver bullet to all your problems. That's a very important thing. 
And second, it's not necessarily easy for an MFI to, 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 to uh, adapt, to, you know, to launch a, an ambitious digital uh, strategy because in terms of uh, culture, it's, a, it's, a, it's something, you know, it's a change. It's significant investment and you don't want to make mistakes because otherwise you will have lost uh, a lot of time, money and energy in, to achieve nothing. Uh, plus, you need to, to, to be good at offering simple client experience to, uh, to, for simple experience to your clients through your, through your digital channel, which is not something which is necessarily intuitive for, for an MFI. So there are a lot of uh, things you need to do right. But ultimately, yes, if you have the ambitions to achieve your mission of financial inclusion, you should take advantage of the digitalization, certainly. That's uh, obvious for me. Thank you. No, that's a really interesting question. I, I want to also maybe flip it and, and ask the same question to the fin, fintechs of, so, so the question was, are MFIs naturally becoming hybrid fintechs? Are fintechs naturally becoming a new generation of MFIs? Uh, so in, in some sense, is there kind of a convergence at the end of these two pathways? Uh, Fatma, what do you think? Um, I'd say it's a mix of both, uh, in the sense that high tech, high touch is essential to where we're going and to improve the inclusion for everyone. But then I would also give an example of M-Pesa in Kenya, which is purely tech. Uh, the only access that they have is maybe the customer service that they call in, and maybe an agent on the other side. So then, as a tech experience, um, M-Pesa allowed people to make payments, and then since we have been able to build other financial services on top of that. And it works because then everyone knows how to use uh, M-Pesa, and so you're able to pick up on everything else from that, whether it's the tech, um, it's insure tech, or it's um, health tech that's, that's being sold to you. So then it's a mix of both, and I'd say high tech, high touch is the way to go. Thank you. Uh, Gregoire Dorcas, do you want to chime in on this question? Otherwise, maybe we'll, we'll open it up for in-person uh, questions here from, from the audience. No, I think it's been adequately um, answered. All right, let's, uh, let's get away from, from Slido for just a minute and, and open it up. Anybody have questions for, for these panelists? I see one person very eager here. Do we have a, a mic? If, if not, if you just want to stand up and I'll just repeat what, what you say. what individual clients might need, but I feel a strong amount of skepticism that only data is gonna enable you to know what individual clients need. So I wonder if the panelists, all of them, could respond to that. Um, don't we need to have at least some conversation that's more qualitative to confirm your hypotheses that you get from the data? E excellent question. And Dorcas, did you catch that, or, or shall I re repeat? I, yeah, I got the last part, which kind of is the question. So um, totally, I, I mean, there are a few things you wouldn't know um, just you know, looking at the data. And really, it's how, how are you asking for this data? What are you even asking for? Um, it depends on what you're asking for before you're able to analyze and then find some insights. There are certain things you wouldn't know. I remember in one of the previous sessions today on the platform, um, when we're talking about persona and then speaking to the fact that a um, someone, a, a young man who is a single father and has some needs. Well, how do you know that, you know, just from data? Because probably the question you're asking is, are you married or are you single? You're not, you, you need to go deeper to get some insights. And that physical interaction gives you access to more insights than the generic, you know, questions that are asked, you know, from these platforms to get data um, or just transactional data. So we're moving to relationship banking rather than just transactional banking. And that's what um, the digital, you know, would also help um, to achieve. So I agree with you. Thank you, yeah, yeah and, and I think, you know, it's, it's very natural to think about how MFIs who have those digital and physical touch points can have more than just pure, pure data. But from the fintech perspective, uh, Craig War, could you say something about this combination, you know, it's just using data in a, in a box, uh, it won't <clears throat> be sufficient, but how, how will a fintech get around that issue? I mean, we don't use data only. Um, I'm coming from a microfinance before, you know, uh, uh, co-founding Simplify. But I would say, like, for me, the biggest difference is that the role of product in the fintech is much more important than um, the one we had in, you know, in the, the 
previous microfinance group I was working, working at in the sense that a product owner on fintech is definitely you know, looking at the data, but we also conduct a lot of client interviews, um, focus group, test group to improve the product. And because then the delivery of the product is done purely you know, digitally speaking, there's a much more like involvement about you know, to test the hypothesis that were received from the data and from the discussion we, you know, we have with, you know, with our clients. And I would say it's easier to be able to test your hypothesis, and I think this is where you know, fintech are, are more trained to it, rather than having a huge you know, sales team that, yes, gives you feedback, but you know, it's always extremely difficult for a product team within a traditional uh, organizations to get all the feedback you need for the clients. And then you also have the way the product is delivered in an app is basically deliver the same product on the, sorry, from, on the same way, whoever deal with this. And I think this is what makes the, you know, I would say a big difference be between both, um, you know, delivery, you know, both solutions. Uh, in one is also more tailored because you might have, you know, the human touch, uh, but if you have another loan officer, you probably have a different experience than the one you have with someone else. While on FinTech, you have, you know, a similar experience through, um, you know, through the mobile app that is given to you. So product uh, is much more important on the fintech. So the role of product management is much more important uh, in the fintech organization. So this is what, what I really see. Yeah, if I can build on that, um, I think that's a very uh, important difference when you see the operation of a fintech and, a, and an MFI. Uh, they focus on testing a product, calibrating it, fitting it, getting to a market, and the ability to use technology to do that efficiently. And also to, to, read, you know, to read the market response and get the product right, um, which is less seen on, on the microfinance side and it's more difficult to do because that's not how microfinance institutions operate. But on the other hand, I mean, one question is can fintechs that have a very technology DNA, can they become good lenders? Can they become good credit operations? And there's a lot of lackings there because on the mic, when you have finance people managing a portfolio, there's a lot that comes to that. Credit is not just a product. There's a lot that goes around, uh, around credit that sometimes fintechs have a hard time building out. Uh, not that they can't, but I think both institutions, those types of business models have certain challenges that they need to, to uh, address in order to reach that convergence point. Yeah, and that question of can, can fintechs go beyond, there, there's a related question that, that came in, in Slido that, that maybe I can uh, uh, turn to, to the panelists, which is uh, when it comes to customer centricity, social performance, uh, can fintechs have the same level of uh, putting the customer at the center? I mean, I think we all know of some of the horror stories of, of fintechs who have not done that. Uh, so how do we, uh, as a community, push these less regulated, more agile uh, entities to be more uh, socially oriented? And, and Fatma, if I could start with, with you on that question. Um, interesting question. Um, again, it's a product that you're selling to a customer. So you, from the word go, you have to start with customer centricity. Does it serve their needs? Uh, are you able to provide that product in a sustainable manner? Uh, because like you said, there are organizations in Kenya, for instance, who had terrible collection practices because there were fintechs. Um, and, and the fact that it was unsecured credit meant that without regulation, they tried everything to get their money back, right? Uh, that's where now regulation comes in, not only from the regulator, but from other uh, fintechs. Um, and we're happy to say that the regulations for fintechs in Kenya are driven by fintech organizations to protect the customer. Um, but in terms of customer centricity, you will not win in the long term if you're not building a product that serves the customer need. And not just now, because I need credit this minute, but long term. A lot of the pushback fintechs get is that they have a small customer value proposition uh, or, or that they can only last for a very short lifetime. 
right? Uh, and that's because then the product is not fit to what the customer requires. And that's where consistent improvement of what the product is uh, comes a long way. So for instance, uh, we had a seven day product and we had customers consistently defaulting on the seven day product because we were not matching their cash cycle to the product, uh, to when they needed to repay. So then observing that from your data points helps you to tweak your product to now then meet that. And those customers that were defaulting, we had a 60% due date collection rate. It moved to a 90%, uh, 96% due date collection rate. So then it's being able to use your data and your knowledge of the customer to then figure out, does my product work for them? Do I then adjust? Uh, and how do I adjust it? Because Long term, you need to take your customers with you on this journey. It's not a one and done. Uh, financial services is not a kettle you're buying or selling. It's, it's a, long, a, a lifetime relationship that you're building with the customer. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more audience questions. Uh, I see two questions in the back. Can we take both questions and then we'll, we'll do a, a wrap up? Thank you, and thank you for the very good panel and interesting questions. Um, I think here we were talking about a divide, right, between fintechs and MFIs, and I understand that's the, the purpose of this panel. But I think there is a lot to learn from each other, and a lot of us question whether fintechs and MFIs should learn from each other. And building, up, building on uh, Javier's comment, I think, um, there is a, still a, a huge uh, issue of fintechs to address the adoption gap or the adoption divide, which sometimes they don't even understand how big it is, right? And there is a need to bring together the supply and demand to understand each other and you know, to be able to, for fintechs to increase that you know, high touch with clients that have great ideas, great solutions, but sometimes they don't fit to all. So this is more than a question, it's just a comment, right? Like, it will be great to learn from each other. Thank you, and the last question from the gentleman in the back. Um, hi, first, I'm Pranav from 60 Decibels and really, really appreciated the panel. The one question I had was about, um, you know, Fatma, you had mentioned the point about uh, FinTechs being able to overlay other services like health tech uh, and others on your existing infrastructure and the digital product. I'm actually curious from the MFIs uh, to hear from you about, is that something that's actually a good idea or possible given your extensive physical sort of presence in these communities because you understand their needs? And is there an opportunity to sort of offer them products that are not financial services but others? How had that been for you and if you think it's a good idea? Thank you. Please, If Stephen. I can, I... okay. Oh, and so the second no, sorry. Question. Uh, can we start with Stephen, and then we'll ask Dorcas to say the last word before we conclude. Okay, on, on the second question, I, I'm not sure I got the first question. Uh, it was more, it seemed like more of a, more of a comment about ah, working okay, together, sorry. getting okay. fintechs to build out. Okay, um, um, so on the second question of whether MFI are well positioned to offer non-financial non services, etc. We, well, we do it already ourselves. Enfin, it depends on what we, we call a non-financial services. Of course, we offer insurance, but that uh, you may consider it's financial services. We offer also training and coaching. We usually we try to do it through partnership. Huh? So we, we, we find uh, partners who have uh, uh, interesting uh, offer for our clients, and you know we we yeah, we. we we intermediate um, between the two. So we've done that typically in Tunisia where we had a big uh, coaching program after COVID, uh, during COVID actually, to help our clients go through this, uh, this type of process. So it's, it's a definitely a yes, uh, but you have to be careful because you are still a financial service provider. So uh, you want this to be, you, you want to give uh, your clients this benefit, uh, but you don't want to be the one doing that. Uh, you, because you, you are the one talking with them about their loan, about their financial services, etc., but not about the maternity, uh, health, or things like that. You don't want to mix the roles, I think. But you certainly can, can uh, give access to services by finding the right partners, yes. Thank you, But Steve. then there's a risk also of, uh, how to say, uh, yeah, uh, you may uh, get diverted too much. So it's, uh, it's never easy. 
Thank you. Uh, so we're almost out of time, but, but Dorcas, just want to give you the chance to respond to that question as, as well about non-financial services and, and MFIs. Uh, if you could keep it to under a minute and then we'll wrap up. All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> just to add that, you know, we're already doing those, um, you, a colleague mentioned microinsurance, um, financial education, trainings. Something we've also added is education scholarships. So one, some of our products are savings products are bundled with those um, benefits for the customer because for us it's a holistic approach to solving the problem. Um, so it's not just financial inclusion, but really looking at the well-being and welfare um, of these people in the bottom of the pyramid. So economic empowerment, social empowerment, health um, issues as well. Um, but like he said, you partner with you know people who already um, are skilled with this, whose business are those, then to offer your customers um, those additional services. So it's definitely possible. We're doing that now. And um, with um, digital platforms as well, we can scale that uh, beyond financial services. Thank you very much. So I think we'll go back to the Slido poll now and see who ended up winning this debate. Um, if we could put that on the screen. There we go. So. Let me. Let's see. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> MFIs. Okay. Again, I think we have a biased crowd here. Yeah. The microfinance week. But uh, <laughs> certainly fintechs uh, provided a, a... Fintech summit. You could kind of repeat the question and leave out the word responsible. <laughs> sure, but that's not what we did. So, uh, and this is, the, this is the question of, of the day. Uh, so... I think we'll, we'll leave it there. I'm going to open up just a, a, a um, feedback poll. I'll have it in, in the background. Uh, and basically just asking, you know, what did you think of the session? <clears throat> Scale of one to five. How relevant was it to you? And then any other uh, feedback you, you have for us. Uh, so I'll just say that as I uh, uh, finish things up. For the conclusion, I think we've had a wonderful dis discussion, uh, lively d debate. We see we have a, a biased microfinance crowd here. Uh, but ultimately, I think as Javier mentioned and many of us mentioned, it's, it's a bit of a false construct. All of the different players that Javier m mentioned or, or showed on that slide have a role to play from suppliers to NGOs to cooperatives to fintechs and uh, we all have a challenge of trying to get financial services, responsible financial services, uh, to excluded and underserved groups. And as we've shown, uh, we think that digital technologies have a, a long way, or have, can push that uh, uh, in many different ways. And I hope we've highlighted a few of the different ways we can do it through MFIs, through fintechs here. Uh, I just want to uh, give a huge thank you to Gregoire, Fatma, Stephen, and Dorcas on the line. Uh, I think they did a wonderful job sharing what's happening at their businesses and in the microenterprise finance universe in general with digitization. So please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists. And that concludes the session. Thank you very much.